Mark. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us in this space we've devoted to uh, reflecting on the liberal arts. And as a founding member of this university, I wanted to ask if you could give us a little, uh, a little bit of an idea of why uh, the institution chose this, this model of, of teaching, of learning, of relating to knowledge. Well, thank you. Thank you for my being here. Thank you for everybody that's incorporated with this production here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be a, a part of this, and I feel very blessed to have been a part of the USFQ from the old house to where we are now. The USFQ is, is pretty much a copy-paste, if you will, of a liberal arts curriculum in the United States. Um, if we take back a historical look at uh, the first university in the United States, Harvard, founded 1636. Um, Mind you, that's 140 years before the 4th of July, 1776 um, signing of the Declaration of Independence. Um, so prior to the country being founded as a country, there was an institution that was dedicated to liberal arts education. Liberal arts essentially um, incorporates um, literature, um, uh, languages. It takes on history philosophy, social sciences, natural sciences. It extends to math. And then, of course, we have the sciences, the hardcore engineering courses, advanced physics and then geometry, etc. But the liberal arts curriculum comes from the founding of universities on the eastern coast of the United States, where it became obviously quite successful. 1701, um, Yale University was founded, um, and basically the same type of curriculum as Harvard. Uh, 1746, uh, um, uh, Princeton University was founded, etc. And and the idea was to be able to give people the knowledge that they needed to be critical thinkers. And we take a look at uh, the Constitution of the United States. We're looking at great men who were visionary. And we would like to think that the founding of this university um, was founded by people who had a vision, a vision that things could be better, that things could be different. And the idea was to, I guess the word is, radically transform the way of teaching in this university. Because prior to our existence here in 1988 in the old house, um, there existed the Escuela Politécnica Nacional, the Escuela Politécnica del Ejército, La Católica no Central. So we came about with a totally different way of doing things because we were incorporating liberal arts into the curriculum. If you were looking just to study um, physics or math or engineering, I guess the Escuela Politécnica would have been the place to do that. In the Central University as well, and uh, their focus was pretty much the same. It, it did not incorporate anything outside of the particular area that you were studying. So we came around with a curriculum that you were required to take an X number of courses outside the field of your specialization, of your degree. Because the vision is to amplify and for you to be able to look forward to different courses that will make you a better person. Um, I remember one particular case of a student I know that had just graduated in medicine in the university. And I was teaching at that time a course that I had invented called Shakespeare. <laughs> and I looked at this student and I knew him well. Pablo, what are you doing here? You just graduated in medicine. He said, yes, that's right, I am. I've got a degree in medicine. And I said, why are you here? He said, oh, I'm just auditing this course, Mark. And I said, Pablo, if I may ask why. And he said, you know, I would like to someday be able to speak to my patients about something other than the weather and their health. <laughs> so I thought that was rather humorous. So he did. He took the entire three months of, of Shakespeare with, for me. He did all the work. And um, 
he wasn't getting it great, of course, but he wanted to Im- submerge, be submerged in the idea of tragedy, comedy, and things of Shakespeare. And he did do a specialization in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And for some reason, we had made a bet about something, and I, I thought he had forgotten it, but I didn't. And when he was in Pennsylvania doing his, his specialization there in some area of medicine, I, I said, remember, Pablo, we betted a beer about something. And he said, you're absolutely right, Mark. When I get back to Ecuador, I owe you a beer. Sure enough, he got his degree in, in, in Hershey, Pennsylvania. He returned to Ecuador, and he invited me out for a beer. <laughs> so that part of liberal arts, that, that, that's kind of something that, that goes beyond just studying a particular issue. Um, it, it becomes surprising to see that we humans can get out of our comfort zone and do something and, and find out that it's very interesting to, to be doing something very, very unique in our lives. My three children graduated from here. And uh, when they all graduated, I said, you know, I think each one of you owe me a million dollars. They all laughed and said, you're probably right, Daddy, but we're not going to pay you anything. I said, okay, well, you're on your own. Okay. So they did. So liberal arts is basically the backbone of approximately 3,000 universities in the United States. Okay? That's what the universities were founded upon. And as things moved westward, and the railroad came in, the Industrial Revolution had impacted the eastern seaboard of the United States, and people were moving westward, moving all the way to California, and um, more of the same was occurring and universities were being founded. And then, of course, there were the polytechnic schools that existed that people had to specialize in a particular science, and thus those institutes were founded as well. But the liberal arts university is pretty much the backbone of the educational system at the university level. And we in this country were the ones who put forth a liberal arts university uh, because. In life, if I may use a metaphor, gears always seem to change. And though you may have studied this and been prepared for this, and this is what you want to do, if you have a liberal arts education, you can go and change gears because you do have the vision and you have the skills in other areas that will enable you to move about freely. And that's what we are about providing students with the skills and the vision to be able to not only graduate from our university and get a job, but ideally to graduate from this university and create jobs for other people. And that is what we hold on to as part of our mission of the university. Now, uh, when, when we discuss the liberal arts or when, when people hear the term liberal arts, they often associate the art bit with painting and sculpture and music. But rather, uh, we are using the word art in, in an earlier sense, right? As in the, the, the knowledge the, um, that you need in order to do something, to carry out an activity. In this case, the, the other word in the, in the term liberal uh, indicates that this kind of, of practice we are cultivating is the practice of freedom, right? To live freely, free from other people's prejudices or opinions or uh, to think independently from what uh, or differently from what other people tell you you should think like or you should uh, behave like or you should act like and rather make those decisions on your own freely. Now, you've been doing this, you've been involved with these ideas for a long time now. What would you say it is uh, to live a life in freedom? Well, as Patrick Henry said, give me freedom or give me death, essentially. Okay? Because if we are not free, 
we live by under a tyrannical leader, a dictatorship, and um, that's never good for progress for humanity. Um, I'm not going to pinpoint points of the world, but there are places in the world where people do not have the freedom to move about. People don't have the freedom to to say what they truly believe in for fear that they'll be imprisoned and tortured and killed. Um, so it just comes to be a very clear understanding of human interactions and, and the way things are going. Um, that without freedom, we as human beings are, are useless beings. We, we, we just follow the mindset of somebody else. To think that in 1933, a very frustrated ex-soldier of World War I came about to be a leader of a frustrated nation that had lost World War I and became their Furter and went on to and September 1st, 1939, invade Poland, and 1940, invading France and European countries. And here we had World War II under our hands because people of all socioeconomic classes were listening to a madman, and they were believing in him, and that the Nazis just needed to be the supreme race. And it was a time in history that we should never forget because people were convinced of this, just like we see in certain cults, religious cults oftentimes. Um, there have been a few incidences where a person comes about as being a savior type figure. And there was one particular case, I remember a man by the name of Jim Jones that had people of all ages drinking Kool-Aid, but it was poisoned. And that was their escape. That was their way out. That was something they had to do to comply with and absolute insanity. Okay? Um, we can do more alive than we can dead. Okay? So, and when we are free, and not to be abusive of our freedom, but to be free, we can move about and make of ourselves and make of other people and make of society ideally a better place for all. And we may not think alike, but you have the right to express yourself and you're not inside of an iron box. So freedom is, is essential for our progress in any society. If there is no freedom, there is no progress. If there is no freedom, there is no liberal arts. There is no, there is nothing of essence that makes of us better people. Thank you so much, Mark, for your wisdom. Thank you for your help. And thank you for your contribution to this project. It is truly invaluable. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I trust that as we progress in, in, in a world that is ever more complex and confusing and difficult to understand in so many different concepts and so many wars that are occurring, understanding and misunderstanding and, and the power that we have to destroy each other and destroy countries and societies and a nuclear capacity to destroy the world several times over. And we just wonder um, what needs to happen for us to be provoked to use all of this. Um, our, our mind can do wonderful things. And unfortunately, the mind can also do very terrible things, as we've witnessed in the history of mankind. My father was a soldier in World War II. He was stationed in Guam. He was battling against the Japanese. And uh, he returned. And like so many soldiers, he fell in love with a woman. And the result of, of that existence, 
as my three brothers and sister. Somebody once asked me, did your father survive the war? I said, well, here I am. <laughs> Obviously, yes. <laughs> but um, so I end on that note, that freedom is absolute requirement for us to be able to establish ourselves as a civilized society, as a society that's um, perspicaciously involved in the development of what will make us as human beings better as individuals, better as a society, better as a country, and better as a world, because we amplify all of that. And it is beautiful to be a part of that process. Well, it would be hard to end on a better note. Mark, okay. thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. 